morning. I know this is Friday because Harvey Oberfeld, our man in Victoria, the pipe is going to be on the air with me first up this morning. And I know this is Friday because it's the end of the week. And I know that the end of this week in Victoria must have left Premier Bennett and those members of his cabinet who are still around and speaking to each other as well as to the public, if we can only get them to do that. It will go down as one of the most tremulous, jittery, upsetting weeks that a government in power in Victoria has had in a long, long time. But I can only judge at long distance. So first thing this morning, we're going to judge at close distance with Harvey Oberfeld, our man in Victoria, after the break. Harvey Oberfeld in Victoria. Harvey, this was a dramatic week. This was the week when Kemp fired everybody. The week that Ellen Mackay and uh, Jack, what's his name, Kelly, decided all of a sudden to go to the police. This was the week of the disclosure by BCTEL of the secret campaign funds about which the Social Credit Party officials seemed to know little or nothing. And this was quite a week and you've been right in the thick of it, so just tell me what you make of it and what the state of the government is in Victoria today. Well, it was not only a dramatic week, it was also a traumatic week, especially if you were part of the government. Uh, the uh, happenings, uh, it was really strange the way it happened because we had been under the impression that after coming back from California, that the Premier had pretty well decided that uh, this was the time really not to say anything or do anything and hopefully the dirty tricks will just die and fade away. But what happened was that uh, all of a sudden we had the announcement we had expected something was going to be happening to Ellen Mackay. In fact, I talked to Ellen Mackay two hours before she was fired. I asked her if anything was up, and she said no. And I said, well, I have the word that you're going to be fired within an hour and a half or two hours. And she was quite surprised to hear that. And uh, we were waiting outside her office when it happened. But we were also just as surprised to see that not only did they fire uh, Ellen Mackay, but they fired everybody in the research caucus, including people who hadn't even started working there uh, until after the election. So it was quite a surprise to see the way uh, you said Kempf tried to handle it, but I believe that there were people up on top uh, uh, higher than Kempf making decisions in this case. Well, let's not mess around with that. The, the whole government apparatus must have been leaking like a sieve. If you had before Ellen Mackay had, that they were going to clean out the balance of the caucus staff, which means now that something like, if I count correctly, seven people have lost their jobs since that first quote indiscretion when it slipped out at the Esquimalt uh, constituency meeting some weeks ago, months ago now. Seven people down the tube. Right. Well, we, uh, it wasn't really a surprise what happened to Ellen Mackay. It was quite apparent from the moment that she came back that they had to do something because she was, she was in there, she was seen on uh, television on BCTV quite regularly talking to us, which I think is, is fine because I think... Uh, the public servants are paid by the public and they should be able to answer questions asked to them by people in the media who really were not there to represent ourselves because when we go home at night we really don't really care that much about uh, some of the things that we have to ask questions about during the day. We have our own personal lives to lead but we're, we're there as representatives of the public asking questions and probing. 
but it was quite apparent the way she was talking and the way the government felt about her that uh, something had to be done, that they were felt very uncomfortable about her. And with the session coming up early in January or February or even March, depending on when the Premier decides to hold it, uh, there'd be so much information uh, going back and forth inside that caucus office that would be considered of as, uh, especially confidential. It was quite apparent that they'd have to do something with Alan Mackay. So we were expecting it. We, uh, we sort of had a feeling that something was going to happen. Just a minute, not just expecting it. Don't forget that Mackay, a very tough person, I don't suppose I can say a tough woman, had first of all been asked to accept a reprimand and she said, no, go jump in the lake. I, I would say that uh, Ellen Mackay is the only hero of the piece so far. I think... Uh, uh, Although she was part of the dirty tricks apparatus well, when it came she, to that. She's the, hero, she's the hero in the way she has handled herself since... Uh, everything uh, started to come apart. Uh, right, you, has, made a, you made a kind of a snide remark there a couple of minutes ago that you don't think Kemp handled it. You don't think that Kemp was the guy who, with the, conclusion, with the concurrence of the entire caucus, said, uh, we need a new, we don't quite know what the budget is from uh, the taxpayer, but we do need a whole new caucus staff, and therefore, aren't we all agreed, gentlemen, moved, right. seconded, and carried unanimously, well, that we give the boots to Susan Cowan Ellen Mackay, poor little Perry Lifton, and the fellow called Husband. Well, the joke going around the press gallery when the official statement came out in the form of a press release was that there were too many words more than uh, two syllables long, so it couldn't have been written by Jack Kemp. But, uh, that is cruel. That was very hobby. cruel. That but, is uh, cruel. Hobby. <laughs> that's that the way cruel. things have been developing over in uh, Victoria these <laughs> days around the Parliament buildings. But uh, speaking of it seriously, uh, uh, there was no meeting, there was no specific meeting where everybody sat down and discussed the future of Ellen Mackay as far okay, as we could determine. Been, could have been done on the telephone anyway. It, mean, was done on, it was done on the telephone. Uh, some people were, uh, according to Kemp, uh, he tried to contact all uh, members of the uh, caucus. Uh, some people have told me uh, privately that uh, they didn't talk to him. Uh, at least one uh, who, will, who uh, talked publicly uh, just briefly on a, in a telephone conversation, Bruce Strachan of Prince George South, he served notice that at Monday's caucus meeting coming up that he's going to raise this matter because he doesn't feel, uh, feel it was handled properly. Uh, he did not speak to Kemp personally, although he did have a message waiting for him when he returned to his office uh, at 5 o'clock after it was all done that Kemp was that's, looking for him. You know, that's really all beside the point. Now, do you, do you agree, some people have been saying very bluntly, that it was a cowardly way to get rid of Alan Mackay? Because obviously they're afraid of a suit for wrongful dismissal. And then we have this other fascinating development whereby obviously under the aegis of uh, Robert Gardner, Vancouver lawyer, Kelly and, uh, and uh, Mackay were told, now cooperate with the police. Go ahead and tell them all you know. Well, I think Although they'll have to be very careful that uh, they don't yeah. implicate themselves in what might be uh, action by the police under the criminal court. That's right. I think, uh, of course, Alan, Mac Alan Mackay and uh, Jack Kelly uh, certainly appears to us that they are responding to instructions that they are getting from their lawyer, and uh, uh, which is normal and I think to be expected in a case like this. Uh, the real surprise, of course, as you mentioned, was somebody, you take Bob Husband, a researcher who was hired, I believe, in June. That's months after the dirty tricks. It was after the election. Uh, Penny Lifton was only a secretary, and if you're going to have a situation where a secretary who types letters and receives phone calls, if she's going to be fired, uh, possibly as a result or allegedly uh, attacked to the dirty tricks affair, yeah. although the government has denied that, Kemp has always steadfastly said that uh, it's just part of an, a reorganization and restructuring because of global accept, budgeting. I and, don't accept that, do you? No, of course not. In fact, uh, uh, I don't think anybody uh, inside the government, if you talk to them privately, will tell you that they see this as just a coincidence. Uh, if I were sitting in the corner office down there right now, I'll tell you what, I'd be not trepidatious, but be wondering what's going to come out now after Dear Kelly and, and Ella McKay turn in these so-called 50 documents. Right. Uh, what happens now? Well, uh, the, police, the police can't uh, do anything but act as quickly as possible to find out and to submit a report. Do they have a deadline for their report? There's no. No. There's no, no. Specific, no. there's no specific deadline. And there's also a question that some people are asking uh, as to what are the police really looking at? Are they confining their, uh, their investigation to simply letter writing? Are they looking at perhaps some other uh, matters that have come up? Certainly that we've been probing on the news, uh, uh, things to do with funding. Uh, and, of course, until the police hand in their report, we don't know what they're looking at. Well, I think uh, we better correct that. The police will not be handing in the report. The police will be conducting a normal investigation, having been first referred specifically to the question of a potential 
uh, forgery of some kind with the Dirty Tricks letters. But thereafter, in the course of their investigation, if the police find a, an apparent breach of the criminal code, it then goes through the normal mill whereby the matters are laid out, considered, go to a prosecutor or a current counsel, and charges laid or not laid. I want to talk to you about the campaign funds, Harvey Oberfeld, our man in Victoria, after the break. <laughs> It's quite funny, Harvey, how uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, we were all inured to and accepted the concept of campaign funds in a little tin box under somebody's bed. But times and morality have changed. Now, how do you, wh what can you tell me about the government's reaction to what is quite uh, almost shocking disclosures and on BC Television News Hour, God bless them, about these secret campaign funds and the kind of buck passing that seems to be going all around the houses. How is the government reacting to this? Well, so far the government has uh, not really said very much. Uh, we had, uh, for weeks now, it's been impossible really to get to, to see the Premier. He's been tied up with Treasury Board, so they say, and very, very busy. Uh, and although I noticed he did give an interview yesterday to a radio station from Vancouver that happened to come over, but for those of us uh, in Victoria, working around the legislature, who have very specific questions to ask, very hard questions. He's been too busy. Uh, but yesterday, the Premier, of course, as we had on BCTV, he did stop and uh, on the way to the Treasury Board, and he was just surrounded by a crush of reporters asking questions. And uh, he seemed anxious to make it clear that he really has nothing to do with fundraising uh, and that he doesn't really know how things, uh, who gathers the money or how it's gathered, and uh, uh, he really doesn't want to know. But well, he did. Uh, he did admit that he does uh, authorize spending of some of the funds, uh, and he did admit, uh, basically, uh, if, by certainly not denying it, and he sort of, by innuendo, seemed to admit that uh, there are secret accounts that nobody in the top echelons of the party knows much about, and I you think see, that's incredible. That, that's what's so incredible about it. The party officials are getting bills to pay. They don't have the money. They send the money back. Now, the public nowadays, especially after things like Watergates and Committee to Re-elect Presidents, want to know where the money comes from to meet the vast expenditures uh, estimated to be more than $200,000 on the $4,200,000 doorstep pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And my position is quite blunt and brutal on it. Who pays the piper calls the chun. That's right. And we're entitled to know who is paying the piper. And if the Premier can say, as he can honestly, that he doesn't know how much money is given, he doesn't know who gives it, because he takes a position that there's no way he wants to know. But That's still, right. he must be in command of the overall system, whereby everything must be copacetic and as clean as a whistle. And we have to remember that we're not talking about sums like uh, 10 $15. Today in the elections, unlike 20, 30, 40 years ago, you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars flowing through people's hands. The uh, spending on the last election by the Silk Reds alone, I believe, is over $2 million. Uh, and of course, it doesn't just relate to the Silk Reds. If the NDP, for instance, is receiving large sums of money, let's say, from a labor organization in the United States, uh, which, uh, so far as I know, they're not. But if they were, I think the public have a right to know where is the money coming from. Uh, as in federally, we have to declare uh, any uh, income that goes to a political party for a campaign, anything over $100, they have to declare the source. In the province of BC, they don't have to declare the source of their funds. They just have to say what they spent and give a total figure. They don't even have to give a breakdown. And that's a real gap that I think the political parties take advantage of. But and, just, uh, it's an even bigger gap than that, if I'm right, Harvey. They only have to declare under the Provincial Election Expenses Act those monies sold after the dropping of the writ and the finish of the election campaign. That's right. Uh, you could have $50 million in another bank account, which you could spend for whatever purpose, I'm using an exaggerated figure, which would never have to be publicly accounted to anyone, that's except right. maybe it would have to be privately accounted to the income tax department. Right, and, and as we found out in this case, through our probing, we find out that uh, here we have accounts that exist, uh, at least one in Victoria that we can find, perhaps more. We find there are accounts that exist that even the president or the top executives of the Social Credit Party don't really know much about. They don't do know where feel, the money comes. Do you feel that this will be ignored by the, the grassroots, the membership of the Social Credit Party? Do you think maybe it's not being, while, while the reporting is excellent, that we are inclined to forget that the public is cynical about politicians still, or cynical about politics, and says, ah, oh, who cares, they all do it. 
Well, the impression I'm getting from people I talk to is that all we're doing is proving what they've always thought that politicians are, you know, really pretty well crooks anyway, and we're just proving it. But, of course, that's not true. Anybody that's been close to politics knows there's a lot of fine people on both sides of the House trying to do their job. But I think certainly within the Social Credit Party, there's a lot of people now who are sitting back throughout the province and just thinking, where is this all going to end? Why doesn't uh, the, the Premier or the people in the party come clean? Why don't they come clean? Why don't they explain exactly what's involved? Open up, let it all hang out, and build from there. It because would seem to me, Harvey, that the final, is this, I hate this phrase, the bottom line, but that the bottom line on this is that all monies that go to political parties for whatever reason must, as in the United States, not yet in Canada, by some of Joe Clark's uh, cabinet ministers, even his minister of finance is objecting to file a statement of his assets under the blind trust regulation. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have the same kind of a needle into the politicians. But one day we're going to have to, it's going to have to be said, every nickel that goes to a political party of more than $800 will have to be publicly disclosed with a maximum contribution of this or that amount. Well, and I well. think that's the point we should make this morning is that nothing has been, nothing that the, even BC Tell has disclosed, BC Television has disclosed, has been illegal, but it's worrisome and that's causes right. suspicion. And I think uh, if we had disclosure of funding up until now, I think the whole dirty tricks affair might not have happened. I think uh, certainly... Okay, one last question. You'll right. stay, all, stay there all day. Uh, but one last question to you. I asked you about the bunker mentality. How does the bunker... Mind you, I, I made a bid of the Premier, uh, Premier uh, Bennett on the air for obvious reasons, and we were informed in the normal manner that he won't have time because he's preparing for the Ottawa conference. Fair enough. Doesn't matter. Uh, if he wants to appear, we're delighted to ask him questions about the campaign funds, dirty tricks, and even the positive aspects of his government, if we can find any these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but how is the bunker mentality affecting you and the boys in Victoria? Well, last week, for instance, that uh, I tried for four days to any of the 31 Socred MLAs to get them to appear on Capital Comment, because we'd had an NDP -er on the previous week. We have Dave Barrett on today, and I wanted an, a Socred in between. Couldn't find one cabinet minister, uh, one MLA who was willing or able or could find the time to appear on the show. Uh, yesterday, uh, just before leaving work, I uh, tried to do a small interview with Dan Campbell from the Premier's office, and as soon as he saw the cameras, uh, he uh, really uh, tore a strip off us, and then when we ran out of film, he really opened up and uh, pretty well told us we'd just better watch it, we're picking on the wrong guy. So they're very sensitive. Uh, we're certainly, I think, I don't, I don't think I'll get as many Christmas cards this year as I got last. Let's put it that way. I'll give you even money. There won't be a session until the middle of February at the earliest. I, I don't think I'll bet you on that because I agree with you. My thanks to Harvey. Oberfeld, is it? Yeah. The pipe. F -E -L -D. Thanks, Harvey. Webster after the break. Almost everyone in British Columbia, I'm sure, is uh, concerned and perhaps a little bit fascinated by the escape from the Vancouver airport on Wednesday of Anthony Bunny Garine, whom you now see here. Not very glamorous pictures, but he's not a very glamorous person. He's a convicted killer and fugitive. Stabbed a couple of people to death, as I recall, uh, in some kind of robbery. And when he was being brought back up from the United States, to which he had he escaped from the authorities in British Columbia, from the prison of British Columbia, he got off the plane in Vancouver on Wednesday, managed somehow to make a break for it, get away, and at the same time, apparently not to be handcuffed, and to have enough money in his pocket to pay for a taxi fare. On the telephone, I've got Inspector Harry Bonner, in charge of the airport RCMP detachment, and Inspector Bonner, a number of people are wondering just precisely what happened and how a guy like Garain, with a record that would make your hair stand on end, can have enough money in his pocket for a taxi cab when he breaks away from the U.S. people. Can okay. you tell me the score, broadly speaking? Jack, I can't speak for the procedure of the U.S. authorities, but uh, normally under, when we escort a prisoner of that nature, we would, uh, he would be handcuffed when he left the aircraft and certainly he wouldn't have any possessions in his pockets. Well, as I understand from the U.S. position, they're not allowed to handcuff people on the aircraft, one. 
too, because of previous difficulties, when they had just been deported, as I believe was the case of Garain, they had to return these possessions to him during the deportation movement that particular day, and that they expected somebody to be at or inside the aircraft when they got to Vancouver. Normally, Jack, is our procedure when uh, we receive information of a prisoner coming in of that nature, we would have one or two of our members up the finger to meet the aircraft when it uh, docked. Was this just, was it the RCMP or the sheriffs who were supposed to be there? Well, it should have been both. The sheriffs were there to pick him up and escort him to wherever they were taking him, but uh, the sheriffs have to be accompanied by our airport detachment members who have responsibility for security on the airport. Putting it quite brutally then, Inspector Bonner, there was a breakdown and liaison somewhere along the line between the police, the sheriffs, and the U.S. immigration authorities. Well, I believe it's a misunderstanding on the part of one of our members and that uh, our policy is being reviewed at the present time to make it a little more clear as to what our responsibilities are okay. under such circumstances to ensure that it does not happen again. Fair enough, fair enough. I suppose the important thing now is to advise people on, in British Columbia to keep their eyes open for Garain, whom I believe is now clean-shaven. Uh, he's not, uh, yes, he's now clean-shaven. And, yes. and to phone the nearest policeman or contact the nearest police car. That is what they should do, yes. should make no attempt to apprehend the person himself, but contact the, the nearest police officer. Because he, he is the kind of man with the kind of record that if he's in a tight spot, he's inclined to be dangerous. He's considered very dangerous, yes. It, Inspector Bonner, thanks for your cooperation. Very good, Jack. Much obliged, bye. Um, I'm going to chat to Darlene Marzari, older person. Isn't that a clumsy word? Clumsy word. City of Vancouver, after the break. <laughs> Darlene Mazzari is an alderman of the city of Vancouver. Uh, pretty good reputation as an alderman, too. Uh, I haven't dared to go to that city council for years now because it generally is so dull. Is it just as dull, dull as it ever was? No, no, Jack, it's not dull. It's not dull. dull. Not dull. It's the best show in town, as a matter of fact. I think if we charged admission, we'd probably do very, very well. Well, now, who's the stand-up comic? Harry Rankin? Well, we've got uh, got a couple, actually. <laughs> Who? Well, between Warnett and Harry and and Bernice and well, Doug Little gets in there sometimes, and uh, well, there's uh, there's there's always something going on. Yeah, and I, I haven't dared to go because uh, it bores, drives me oh, to distraction no. to go to Vancouver City Council. Well, I shouldn't make that admission on the air, should I? No, you could make that admission on the air. I just. Okay. It's a, it's a truly dynamic place to be, Jack. I am also absolutely fascinated by the vital issue of the ward system for the city of Vancouver. Having known for years that uh, it had to come one day, we finally got a plebiscite which gave a 51% approval. And then we got the Eckhart study, Eckhart and Clark and company. And down it came with a partial ward system report with which I am sure you are entranced. Entranced is not a good word to use there. Give me your own word. I'm... I'm well, I can't say I'm disappointed because I didn't have a, a, a large expectations for this commission. At the beginning of the exercise, I was, as you're aware, I'm very much in favor of the uh, full, of the full ward system, and uh, I was not in favor of moving towards a commission which I felt might be party line NPA, which is keep the at large system going. Consequently, as a well, what happened was basically we got ourselves a commission that tried to give the mayor what he wanted and the NPRs what they wanted. But even this commission, which was largely appointed friends of the NPA, could not, could not justify keeping the at-large system. So they bent over backwards to try to find something that wouldn't offend anybody and ended up really offending everybody. Yeah, labored and labored mightily and brought forth confusion. That's right. That's well, right. you know, uh, I used to be a kind of proponent of the at-large system, but if it matters anything, I seem to be changing my mind. You, you would go straight for the Donald Gutstein proposition of yes, yes. how many wards? Well, 13 wards is what's recommended here. I think we'd have to mess around with that a little bit because it's nice to have an uneven number of people on council so that you can Oh, 13 break a plus tie. the mayor would be 14. 14. So you'd have to go down to 12 plus one or... Or 14 plus or one. Or 14 plus That's one. That's right. Now, this particular system, though, has some attractions. They've suggested a partial one. Mm -hmm. The five uh, provincial constituencies, three from each constituency. Right. Would they have to be resident in the constituency? According to the report, yes. 
they, they have a residency requirement, which is the only thing that makes the report have any sense whatsoever, in my opinion. In other words, you couldn't uh, parachute in from outside. That's right. You're, you'd have to be known to be elected in your ward. That's right. You'd have to live in the ward. That's something that I have sympathy with, but there I don't agree with anyone. Um, area doesn't agree with that, and neither does Cope, so I'm rather out in, in uh, left field left by myself field there. Yeah. Uh, is there any hope now, technically speaking now, what has Volrich achieved? He's brought in this report, right? Mm-hmm. Does he really, uh, and you took some action in council the other day, or some non-action, what was it you did? Well, the non-action and the non-event was the fact that in January we'll have a big public meeting and listen to delegations and go through the whole procedure again. Well, that's silly, isn't it? Well, I guess one can say, Jack, that uh, what's been achieved through this whole exercise is time. You mean time, uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, mayor has bought time so that we don't have to face bite the bullet this year so that we don't have to go to the provincial government and, and recommend charter amendments so that it looks like in 1980 no changes will be uh, there w w everybody will be going to the polls and voting for 65 aldermen and choosing the top 10 from what they remember from the Jack Webster show and from from coverage in the media and uh, and we'll end up with uh, much the same council so we, we, all he's done is he's gone through a withdrawal action deliberately you say to stall and confuse and do nothing until he's safely re-elected if he runs again in this, is it November or December? It's December. November, it's November. November 1980. That's what I'd suggest, yes, yes. And if some of these other recommendations are accepted, such as a three-year term, the uh, existing majority will be assured another three years after so, 1980. while he might not go for the ward system, the partial ward system, he won't go for that. Mm -hmm. You think he might go for a charter amendment to be elected for three years? I, th I would suggest that that's a possibility, a good possibility, that okay. some of the rest of these recommendations might D come into being. Hey, Darlene Masari, give me your pitch for the, for the ward, the oh. pure ward system. Sounds better coming from you. When it comes from Bruce York, I always look at it with a little bit of disfavor because we're friendly enemies mm -hmm. on opposite ends of the political spectrum. You're saying that we're friendly friends, are you, Jack? I'm saying that you're not an enemy. <laughs> give me your pitch. Okay. Uh, for, the, for the single ward system with the candidate living in the ward. Okay. Well, basically it boils down to representation by population, okay? So that everybody who lives in the city knows who they're sending to City Hall to represent them. That they're close by, that they can be easily reached with a telephone call. Their requests don't get lost in a maze of 10 or 11 or 14 aldermen. That basically people know where the buck stops and they can call their aldermen and get some some action. And uh, I guess on top of that is the fact that uh, Vancouver is neighborhoods and it's important that those neighborhoods be recognized and particularly the east side neighborhoods that don't get recognized now. And you can see that both in budget terms and in policy terms. That I suppose has been the biggest traditional weakness from a point of view of, of, um, of city administration in that for a thousand years, or 25 or 30 that I know of, the aldermen elected at art large have always, by and large, except for a couple of Harry Rankin and Alfred Wilson, I think it was, lived west of Camby. Mm -hmm. Isn't mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps they, they were elected because they were the best candidates. Well, you know it's the top ten hit parade by the time 60 candidates are running for aldermen. And so you don't really get to know the aldermen that are running But therefore, uh, from the purposes of my point of view, we might as well forget any prospect of the pure ward system in Vancouver due to the stalling tactic by Volrich for another five years. Well, I don't know. I think there, there may be a chance uh, that, that, that if... I don't think that the existing council is going to uh, change its mind about going to Victoria. But I think that if enough pressure is placed uh, on them that they might budge somewhat because the full ward system does not do them any any harm it might do some of them harm because it'll spread spread the votes around but crazy, crazy question mm -hmm. do you think if the NDP wins the next provincial election they might impose it well Harcourt assures me that this is the case oh he's <laughs> a good NDP isn't he yes that's right and he so says when the NDP when the NDP win the next election that's right. they'll impose it that's what Harcourt tells me would you like to see that well I'd like to believe that that could happen that it would be imposed, although I don't like senior governments imposing things upon the municipalities when I think when you've got a uh, over 50 percent vote and a majority in favor of a ward system that that's something that that uh, the provincial government should take into account. 
Tell Darlene Masari what you think of the ward system, which one you'd like to have. Should we do a poll on it? Sure thing. CBC is doing it. one right now. And, I, and uh, what? So why don't we do one? What? Yes, that's right. Hit Good the morning. kill button. The, the woman <laughs> said a bad word. What do you want? Do you want the at large or a simple ward system? Forget the partial. Tell me now on the following numbers. To Darlene Mazzari, after the break. The Webster Polling Organization is about to move into high gear. Darlene <laughs> has asked me, and I have, of course, acceded. Most people on the air say acceded. It's acceded to her request to take three answers from each caller, or one of three options. At large, partial, or full ward system. So just tell me, don't mess around. Just say at large, partial, or full. Okay, f I, you say full. Hmm? You say full. Oh, yes, I'm in favor of no, full. No, I say full. Full. You say it differently from me. But you can't help it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, full, Jack. Full, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. That's you. Are we going to have trouble with them this morning? They're not paying attention. Hold on. Go ahead, please. Yes, full, please. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, would like the ward system and residency in the ward. Thank you, that's full. Go ahead, please. Partial on the provincial constituencies. Thank you. Partial on the provincial constituency. Go ahead, please. Hello. Well, it's not working this morning. The people on the... Turn down your television set, and when you come to the telephone and you hear my voice barking at you, give me the response at once. Go ahead, please. Ward system. Which? Full ward system. Okay. Your response, please. Good morning. I'd like a full word. And why could, can that be taken to court? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm not taking your comments. Go ahead, please. Where are you? You cheeky thing. I'm going to persist with this one. Are you there? There's nobody on one. It must be an NPA trying to block the thing. <laughs> That's a dirty trick. trick. Go ahead, please. Linda, we're not having much luck this morning. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Full ward system. See, that one worked. Next. How about you? Full ward system. Thank you. How about you? Full. Thank you. How about you? Come on, number six. How about you? Linda, what are they doing this morning? Can't they do as they're a talk? They're thinking. They're thinking. Hello? Well, yes, how about you? At large, please. At large. Thank you. Okay, I shall now give you a count while the people on the telephones uh, clean up their act. Two for at large, two for partial, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for full ward system. Like I my shall try again. says you quit when you're ahead. I'm on delay. Take me off delay. Can you take me off delay? Can't do that. Can't do that. That's the problem. I'm on delay. We just learned the technique what here. What does that mean? It means that there's seven seconds the other side of me. Ah. Go ahead, please. So that if I say dirty words... Oh. That's a, uh, did you say full ward system? Full. Oh. What did you say? Full. Oh. Full, thank you. How about you? Full ward system. Thank you. How about you? Full the ward system, please. Thank you. And you? Full. Full? Full. full. Yes. And you? Full. Full. And you? Full ward system. Time these stand had some representation. Goodness gracious me, that's now 15, 2, and 2. That's quite incredible, isn't it? Well, it's it? not surprising because the, uh, the uh, plebiscite returned that kind of uh, numbers, except for the three areas that voted against, but they voted in such huge bulk that uh, they brought the percentage down to 51%. Go ahead, please. Full. Can't hear you. Full. Oh, you don't sound very well this morning, but you want the full ward system. God bless you. How about you? Full, and uh, why Eckhart's report? He's uh, so good. Well, that's not a crime. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like full ward system. Thank you very much, sir. And you? Full. Thank you very much, madam. And you? 
Forward, are these all your relatives and friends? Yeah, all my relatives there. Did you know that we were going to do a poll this morning? No, I didn't. Neither did I. Go ahead, please. Cold War, George. Thank you. I'm not George, I'm Jack. <laughs> are you there? Just one moment, please, see if I can get this line on the air. Say that again, sir. At large. Thank you very much, at large. Yeah. How about you? Full war, Jack. Thank you. How about you? Full war system, please. I hope you only called once. How about you? Uh, full war, please. All of uh, Bruce York's friends must have been summoned to the telephone. I think so. Full war system. That's 25, 2, and 3. How about you? At large. At large. That's four for at large. How about you? With residents. Full with residents. Well, that's 26 for them. How about you? Full ward system. 27. You're next. How about you? Oh, no ward system. We had it once. That did work. Hello, ma'am. Do I ever recognize your voice? Go ahead, please. Partial. Partial. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Full ward system. Thank you very much. And you? At large. At large. Thank you, my dear. And you? At large. Thank you, my dear. And you? Full war, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and you? Come on, come on. A full war system. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Full war system. Go ahead, please. And you now. Go ahead. Oh. Full, thank you. And you? Full war system. Full war system. Full war system. That's quite incredible. And you? Where are you? Full ward system. Good. Don't have to shout. Just answer quickly. <laughs> How about you? System. Full ward system. Did you say full? Did she say full? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Full ward, full ward system. Thank At you. Large. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, yes. At large. At large. Eight. Mm -hmm. You? Full ward. Hold on. That's 38. I'm going to take a break to give some of the opposition a chance to catch up. With Darlene Mazzari, a teensy little polling thing. The score at the moment is eight of the callers are in favor of at large, three of the callers are in favor of. Continue, yes, yes, partial. And. Th Freddie, don't interrupt me when I'm counting. <laughs> and 38 are in favor of a full watch system <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Give me an indication from the original plebiscite, 51%, how the voting went, east to west. Yeah, I think it's important because that shows you why this result is not surprising. We have one, two, three, four, five, the six or seven east side wards, including Kitsilano and the West End, coming in from between 56 and 61% in favor of full wards. Um, the voter turnout there, however, was somewhere between 34 and 30, 32 and 35 percent. So it was a low voter turnout, but with a high percentage in favor of wards. Then you have Fairview, South Vancouver, Victoria, and Little Mountain coming in around 53 percent in favor of wards. The voter turnout there was 27 to 33 percent. But Point Grey, Marpole, and Shaughnessy, the areas which have all the aldermen now and which enjoy the full benefits of a ward system right now, they turned out 50% voter turnout, but voted down the ward system yeah, because no. they've got it now, right? Okay, well, at the moment we're going eight in favor of at large, three in favor of partial, that's Volrich's Eckhart's delight, and 38 for the full ward system. Yeah. Do you excuse my voice this morning, will you please? Oh, wait, is there something wrong with it? Jesus. How do you vote? Full ward system. Thank you. How do you vote? Full ward system. Thank you. How do you vote? Full oh, from Carisdale. Full ward system. 41. From How do you Carisdale, vote? Carisdale. 42. How do you vote? Full ward. 43. How do you vote? Full ward system. 40, democratically. 44. How do you vote? Full to get rid of Bernice. Oh. How's that? Oh, never mind it. That's a silly call. We like Bernice, don't we? Yeah. Mm, sure we do. Go ahead, please. Full ward system and an empty full rich seat. Thank you. How do you vote? Full ward system. They're getting more 46. interesting. <laughs> How do you vote? Come on, come on. You're next. I didn't hear you, sir. Uh, full ward. Thank you very much, sir. And you? Large. At large, thank you. And you? Full ward system. Thank you very much. And you? Full. Full? Yes. Some people whisper, you know, 49. I'm getting old and deaf. 
Yes, yes. Four words. Thank you. And how about you? At large. At large, ten. The score now is ten at large, three, three for partial, and fifty for full ward. It must mean something. I think it does, yeah. And I don't think you can rig these poles from the outside because the pressure of calls is so heavy. The chances of getting through a second time are very tough indeed. Go ahead, please. Full ward. Thank you. And you? At large. Thank you. And you? Full ward system. Thank you. And you? At large. Thank you. And you? At full ward. Thank you. And you? Full ward, please. Thank you. And you? At large. Thank you. And you? Full. Thank you. And you? Full. Thank you. And you? Full. Thank you. And you? Full ward. Thank you. Full ward, please. Thank you. I've got that one. Next one? Full ward. Right. And you? Come on, come on. Answer the phone. Full ward. Thank you, sir. And you? Full. This is quite astonishing. Have you thought of running for mayor, Jack? I'd win. <laughs> is that Don't your problem? Don't be silly. <laughs> this is the trouble. If I ran for mayor, I would win. You'd have to move into the city. I'm telling you, this day, if I ran for premier, I would win. <laughs> Humility is one of his stronger virtues. Yeah. Say it to that camera. No, that camera. Yeah. Humility is one of his stronger virtues. <laughs> Don't forget modesty. Mod Go ahead, please. Where are you? Oh, oh hooray, 62. Oh. I wonder what the Americans on the cable think when they watch this program. They're probably phoning in. <laughs> <laughs> Good crack. Touche. Go ahead, please. Ward system. I haven't had so much fun since Granny died. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I want to live in a democracy, full ward system. Okay, don't need a speech. <laughs> right? Come on, come on. Where are you? Full ward, please. Uh, you're slow this morning. How about you? I'd, vo I'd vote for the full ward system. It's quite incredible. 66, 3, and 13. Try again. I'll go right down from the top. How do you vote? Full ward. 67. And you? Award. 68. And you? Award. 69. And you? Award system. 70. And you? Come on, come on. Go no. work system. 71. And you? At large. 14. And you? 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 <laughs> Nobody there. And you? Are you there? Full Vard. Okay, he can't hear his voice, but he was there. That's 72. Down from the top again, Darlene. All right. Go ahead, please. I think I'll let Linda line them up. Are we there? It's really quite simple. Are you simple. there? You're not there. We'll start from the bottom this time. Are you there? Full. Full, thank you. 73. And you? Full ward. 74. And you? Full ward, please. 75. And you? Full ward system. 76. And this you. may be the day, Jack. It may be the day. Yeah, and you. Come on, come on. System. How about you? What did you say, sir? Full ward system. Thank you very much. And you? Full ward system. I've never seen a response well, like this on any poll. My suggestion would be that we plug you right into the city clerk's department and we use you as a referendum machine. How about that? More effective, I'll tell you. Go ahead, please. Come on, come on. Go ahead, please. At large. Thank you, ma'am. And you? Yeah, efficiency at large. 16. And you? Full ward system. Full ward system. And you? Oh, full, sir. This is incredible. I'll have to take a new sheet of paper. Okay. Well, you Six can write smaller so you don't waste paper there. 16, but I haven't got my glasses on, so I've got to write big. 16, 3, and 80. So we've taken 80, 96, 99 calls. Well, let's take one more and then we can give you a percentage without working it out. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Full ward. Can I leave my number to call you later? No, don't call me later. Not today. I'm not feeling too good. 81% of those people who have called in at this particular time are in favor of a full ward system. Does that surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me, but I am slightly overwhelmed with the sheer response there. I think that's wonderful. You know, I thought, what am I going to have on the air this morning? Victoria, fine. Darlene, nice person. Ward system. I thought, oh my, it's going to be dull. You thought the ratings would be low, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, well, fantastic. You go. go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. South Vancouver wants a uh, full ward system. 82. You? Full ward system. 83. You? At large. At large. 17. You? Full 
ward system. 84. You? 12. 85. You? At large? 18. You? Come on, come on. I feel you? like you're in a political convention, <laughs> don't you? From Missouri. <laughs> this camera <right> here. <laughs> I'm talking to Freddie. That's the oh, problem. <laughs> keep your eyes off Freddie. You'll fool up your breakfast. <laughs> Freddie, stand near the camera. <laughs> the woman can't keep her eyes off you. How do you vote? Oh. 86. And you? Oh. 87. And you? Can't hear you. And you? At large. At large. 19. Go ahead, please. Full vote. I had you before. Have you voted twice? No. All right, I believe you. Some you? people have similar accents, Jack. You might not have noticed that. You know, I never thought never of that. Never thought of that. You can always tell there different Scotch accents. Yeah, that's, you can. Oh, you oh, can. I can, but I mean, if it's uh, some other mm -hmm. origin, I might just think they're all making the same you phone could. call. You could easily think that. I apologize. Yes. You have a good middle Atlantic Canadian you accent. You think I do? Yes. Oh. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yes, you, sir. Uh, full ward. Full ward. 89. How about you? Uh, full ward. 90. We'll keep going to 100. I'll go to the 100. Are you there? It's easier to work out math. Ward. What did you say? Full ward. That's 91. Next one? Large. 92. Next one? Large. Can he at large? 20. And you? Full ward. 93. And you? Full ward. 94. And you? At large. 21. And you? Full ward, please. 95. And you? Full, please. 96. And you? Forward. 97, and you? Forward, sir. 98, and you? Forward. 99, and you? Four. 100. I'm grateful indeed for the other listeners and all those on the telephone and viewers, but we'll call it off now. The official result, Darlene Marzari, is of the 124 calls taken so expeditiously and efficiently on a clear, simple question, what do the voters want? Partial, at large, or full. 21 registered their vote for at large. Three registered their vote for partial. And 100 registered their vote for the full ward system. Come, Jack. Well, if you and Bernice are both on the farm and we can keep Harry awake and not too pompous. You think, we, you think you'd come? I think I'd All come. All those things had to be guaranteed first, though. Yeah, George Poole's got to be loud. Warren at Kennedy's got to be important. Doug Little's got to be picky. <laughs> and, you know, and Bernice has got to be straightforward. She's yes, terrific. Yes, I, yes. I think I like Bernice best of mm -hmm. all. Apart from yourself. <laughs> Webster, my thanks to Darlene Marzari. How's the new baby? It's marvelous. Boy? Four months old yesterday. Boy? Boy, Robert. You, aren't you lucky? Yeah. I have a new grandson, too, who's a... How old is my new grandson? <laughs> September, October, November. When was he born? August. What date? Sixth. Oh, my grandson Robert. Your Cam grandson Luke's Robert? Born, he was Same name. August the 19th. Well, they're only two weeks apart. That's right, except that you're the direct mother and I'm the grandfather. Oh, well, one That's generation. Generation gap. Mm -hmm. My thanks to Darlene Mazzari and our best of wishes for Robert. Thank you. Out to the break. On this segment, I shall probably be accused of some kind of back-scratching, incestuous program. Because with me is a man, if you can put him up, in a tartan jacket. A very dull tartan jacket. <laughs> what is uh, the tartan of that dreadful-looking jacket? It's a black watch. Uh -huh. And it's the only one that I had with me, Jack, because I've been traveling around the world for five weeks now on a purely personal visit, seeing my son married in Australia, and I get into Vancouver, and such is the power of British tourism that they snap me up right away, and I'm on this program of yours. Very did he proud. marry an Australian, the boy? He did. Oh, God, <laughs> help him. Uh, uh, the man is uh, Robin McClellan, CBE. That's right. What does that mean? Commander of the British Empire? It does. How did you know that? Chairman of something called the Scottish Tourist Board. How long have you been doing? You're an industrialist, man. You're not a tourist flat. 
Oh, I'm a failed industrialist. I had 40 years of it, and then my courage failed me after that, because you want to get out of industry when you've been at it for as long as I had. How old are you, said Webster, to use his hand and joke? I don't know how old I look, but I'm 63. 63. You don't look a day more than 62. Ah, oh, how wonderful. Thank matter you. matter of fact, you're much older than I am, Robin McClellan, and we've met before. I've been to you on your radio program years ago, and you in gave the, me a very hard time. In the Georgia Hotel. That's right. Perhaps we can do it all over again this morning. I'd love to. What were you selling at that time? Uh, uh, tartan-bound copies of Rabbi Burns? <laughs> very, very dull rubber and plastics goods made in Glasgow, sold in large quantities to Western Canada, and uh, but that's all the past now. I, I presume you're still selling these kind of things. No, I, I got uh, retired, you see. You were retired. Yes. So they had to find a job for me, so they put me in the Scottish Tourist Board. Chairman, with a budget of how much? Four million pounds, eight million dollars a year. Almost nine million dollars a year in today's on. exchange. Getting on. And part of it used for little trips around the world for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this particular trip, sir, is paid for by the McClellan pocket. I merely wanted to establish for the benefit of any Scottish taxpayers yes. watching, and I'm not one, you know, that you had paid for this particular trip yourself. And they get value for money, I can assure you. I'm afraid to go to Scotland. Why? Is there a warrant out? I make the cracks, <laughs> sir. <laughs> no, as far as I know, there is no warrant out. Although there is another Jack Webster who writes the Sunday Express mm. for whom I am constantly confused. Yeah. No, I'm afraid to go to Scotland because my friends go and come back regularly and they tell me horrifying tales of the expense, like 41 pounds for a single room in the old Caledonian Hotel in Princey Street in Edinburgh. Yeah. Could that be true? I think that's slightly exaggerated, but not everybody wants to go to the Caledonian Hotel in Edinburgh. I think they could probably get in, certainly not in high season, for a good deal less than that. But the great thing about Scotland is that you can pay virtually what you want to pay. If you want to go to a top-class hotel in the one the most beautiful streets in the world, Princess Street, Edinburgh. Fine. Oh, I thought you were going to say Hope Street, Glasgow. <laughs> That's only beautiful at the bottom where the ladies are. I see. Yeah. <laughs> What's the one? North British. The North British is also in Princess Street, Edinburgh. And well, then, is that not the best hotel in Edinburgh? Well, it used to be, and it's still good, but I wouldn't say it was any better than some of the others. But my point is that you can travel in Scotland, and indeed in most parts of the United Kingdom, at the sort of price you want to pay. Now, if you really want to know the country and really want to know the people, why, why do any better than go to bed and breakfast? Where for about, uh, let me see, three pounds, seven dollars a night, eight dollars a night, you can live in with a family, experience what they have to experience, and that's very often a very good life. You're saying that for 16 dollars a night, yes, you can get bed and breakfast, providing, of course, you must add the tip that you've got to stop early in the day to find a bed and breakfast, otherwise you'll finish up in the local Heelan Hotel <laughs> paying fancy prices. Fancy prices. Well, we've even got that one answered now because we've got a wonderful thing called Book a Bed Ahead. Book uh, a Bed book Ahead. Book a Bed Ahead. It used, to, it used to be called Robin's Book a Bird a Bed, but it's now... <laughs> <laughs> I see this is rather racy for the tourist board. Oh, yeah. Robin's Book a Bed Ahead. That was the kind of nickname for it, but Book a Bed Ahead means that you can go into any of our 160 tourist offices in Scotland and let's say you're in Glasgow and you want to be in Fort William that night, they will book that room for you in advance and you know very well that you, when you get there it's ready for you and that will book be... Book a Bed Ahead book but no a Book a Bird Ahead. <laughs> You've got to take your own you, bird with you're you. You've got to take your bird with you, right? <laughs> see, book a bed ahead. I'm telling you, the it's Scottish Tourist Board will disown you when we learn about this program talking about book a bird ahead. Book a bed ahead, but not a bird ahead. Uh, it's now known as Baba. B-A-B-A. -B -A. Baba. Baba, yes. Book a bed ahead. And it's exclusive to Scotland. Baba. 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 What happened to your accent, by the way? Well, it kind of slipped when I was about 13. For some reason or other, they took me, my parents took me away from Creef, which, Jack, I needn't tell you, is in the middle of Perthshire. Beautiful place. It's lovely. Great golf courses. Great courses and the hydro and all that. And they sent me down to the southwest of England, to Bristol, where for about three or four years, I was <laughs> brung up as, a, as an Englishman. And you also went, I hate to tell people this, 
to the Ecole de Commerce in Lausanne, Lausanne. Switzerland. That was pour apprendre la Francais, but I've for forgotten a good deal of it. C'est impossible pour moi. Je suis Écossais tout le, toute la route. Toute la route, <laughs> toute la route, toute la route, all the way. The, all the way. Nay, foreign tongues will cross my lips. Well, you see, there's a great connection, if you remember, between those who spoke French in the old days and Scotland. A lot of words we still use have Scottish connections. A tacity. A tacity. Uh, a jigger of beef. Jigger? Jigger of, of lamb. That was a leg of lamb. Jigger. Oh, jigger. Jigger. Right. Jigger of lamb. Yes. And it comes in on a, well, what is it? An assiette, but... Uh, Ashet. Ashet, right. See, I That's know the it. working class words. You know the French fancy words. That's right. And then there's another one that comes to mind quickly. What is it? Quickly, 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 quickly. I can't quickly. think of any immediate. Oh, yes. It's one uh, of which we, we don't normally give the explanation, but we will in this racy program this morning. Garde Lou. Oh, yeah. Garde Lou. Why not? Watch out for your heads. Garde Louis. Garde Louis. Why, yeah. Robin McClellan, did they shout Garde Lou in the streets of that well, dirty town, Edinburgh, a few many years, years ago? <laughs> many years ago, and before the Scottish Tourist Board got involved in helping the hotels to become better. If you lived up a stair, and lots of people did, and had to get rid of the dirty water and all that went with it, you threw it out of the window. But you were decent enough to shout out Garde Lou before you did it. Garde Lui. So the chaps could just jink on one side and not get it on their head. Jink means to dodge to one oh, side, dear caller. Jink is not a word. And dunt is another word that's not normally. That's right. You could get dunted in the heed with the contents of a Garde Lou. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you, there's another French word. I remember Go it so on. well when I learnt over there. They said to me, uh, is it true in French uh, that you have le Loch Ness Monster? Aha, <laughs> and this was the great word in Switzerland in the 1930s and still is in Scotland, le, le, le Loch Ness Monster. Le Loch Ness Monster. Uh, Did they ever find it? Or no, is that just a tourist gimmick? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer to that. And I know that BC has also got some secrets along this oh, way. Oh, we've got phony monsters. Are they? Ours are straight yeah. phony. I know people who are absolutely determined that there is a Loch Ness Monster, and they can prove it, and they are absolutely dedicated to it. But just how genuine they are, well, it's not for me to say. So There's there are... certainly something. Any time I drive along in my little hired car beside a Loch Ness, with the wind blowing 40 miles an hour from the north, and the rain pelting into my windshields. <laughs> you can't even see the water while it's the monster. <laughs> eh? That's true. Well, it always has made me wonder just a wee bit why it normally appears just before the tourist season begins. There's a sort of connotation there. Bite the Ababa, book a bed ahead. That's that right. is a good idea. Does it work? And it works very well indeed. It doesn't work for bed and breakfast. It does. Only where they've got the phone. Well, I agree that Mrs. McTavish and the somewhere outside Oban probably hasn't got a telex in her front room, but we do somehow get the messages to her, whether it's little boys running with forked sticks carrying... I don't know, but somehow or other she gets the message. Maybe uh, the big Highland policeman goes along on his bicycle <laughs> and says, Mrs. McTavish, have a couple of strange ones from Vancouver <laughs> staying with you the night. Hide the silver. <laughs> and her eyes light up and she thinks, good, I'm going to make some money tonight. No, that's good, the barber thing. It's a good idea. I'll use it the next time I'm over. Well, you do that. Try it. The only trouble with me going to Scotland is that I immediately get recognized by my accent as some kind of wealthy yank. Uh -huh. And I become suspicious at once of the price oh, of a dram. Yes. Well, I got to uh, say, Jack, you're going to mix with better people because <laughs> <laughs> the real true Scottish hospitality, they won't oh, no. put it on just no. because they think you can't. Bed and breakfast say. is the way to stay in Scotland. It is a good way. It really is the only way to stay in Scotland. Mind you, the last time I was over, which is about three years ago, I think, must be three years. You must come back. I was perturbed by the appearance of American-style motels along the highway. All terribly nice and hygienic and with showers and whatnot, but uh, they don't seem quite in character. I suppose they must just be accepted. They must be accepted, but I'm very interested. You would say that you saw these motels, because I've just been for two weeks in New Zealand where really they have got that motel business sewn up. I think it's superbly done in New Zealand, and I'm not here to crack Oh, it's beautifully done tourism. here. And, in, and of course in Canada. In California, I especially. I thought that in Scotland we were a long way behind in oh, that no, respect. I, I've stayed in a couple you of motels. Yes. No, no, I don't like the motels. I'd rather stay bed and breakfast yes. than stay in a motel. You know, <laughs> for instance, I always remember when I was staying with the McDonald's just outside Inverness, and uh, my wife and I had a 
the upstairs bedroom in a council house. Mm -hmm. And we came down in the morning and we're sitting there. Uh, do you want porridge? Yes, please. Uh -huh. And little Miss MacDonald put out the porridge, nicely steaming with the proper amount of salt in it and with a good skin on the top of it, you know what I mean. And in came her elder brother, Donald MacDonald. And Donald says, oh, your visitors? Ha ha, says I. Where from? Says he. Vancouver, says I. Oh, in that case, you better have a wee touch of the bros in your porridge. And he went into the cupboard, pulled out his whiskey, poured me a measure, and put it on my porridge. I thought that was very warm, <laughs> comforting, and hospitable. And at that hour in the morning, you liked it? Oh, I took it because uh, I wasn't going to insult them. Yeah. <laughs> and furthermore, there was no charge for the whiskey. <laughs> well, that was wonderful. Just love. <laughs> in the morning. You liked it? Oh, I took it because uh, I wasn't... Uh, now, uh, should we be serious? Oh, I don't really think we should be no, that serious. Let me just say how delighted we are in Britain. Scotland, of course, loves Canadians and so does England and so does Wales because we're part of the United Kingdom. But we do hope that as many of the Canadians as possible will come over and visit us. An interesting development. So many people in Canada or around the world are of Scottish origin. Now, those times are passing and we realize that we can no longer just depend on the first generation coming back to see where their grandfather was. So we've got to make certain even more than before that we are competitive and keen and kind and that the people give a proper reception. That's my, that's my commercial for the morning. Well, fair enough, I had a friend who was going to tell, told me he was going to Scotland the other day and uh, should he take a U-drive? What do you yeah. call you drives? Oh, self, what is it? Uh, yes, you know, hire your own car. Ha car. Ha car. Ha car. Yeah. I said, it'll cost you now and a leg. I said, if you want to see Scotland properly, don't hesitate to travel on the train yeah. and on the bus. That's right. Uh, keep your baggage down to a minimum. So maybe dump most of your baggage somewhere and go on trips. Yep. And travel on the bus, buses and the cars, because that's by far the best way to see the country. Of and meeting the people, too. Buy a Brit Rail Pass before you leave Canada. That's uh, mm. another commercial, but it's very well worthwhile because for a sum which I can't remember offhand, you can use the train for two or three weeks or more, mm -hmm. all paid for in advance, and meeting the people too. Uh, they have a sense of humour, I must confess, although it's a bit twisted. I remember the last time I was in Scotland, where I was stopped to ask for directions in, oh, it was somewhere in central Scotland, somewhere. I think it was, it was Carluke. Carluke, in yeah, Carluke, really. where they make the marmalade. And I asked this woman, I said, this is a good looking town here. I said, I suppose you all have steak for dinner in Carluke every night. She said, no, she said, no. We call a piece on jilly a Carluke steak. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very funny. Is that funny? I think, I think it is. You have, to, you have to know, of course, that jilly is yeah, made in Carluke. That's right. Uh, that's very Freddie good. Freddie didn't laugh, he but didn't. then again, no, I think that's very good. He's of English origin. Yes. But there are a lot of jokes in every country which are sort of in-jokes, and it's part of the measure of the intellect Tell the, of the people, people here that nobody wears the kilt in Scotland. Oh, no, that's not true. They Except do Except little hard. boys at fancy schools. No, no, no. I love to wear the kilt, and I wasn't at a fancy school wearing the kilt either. No, the kilt is being worn more and more, I think, now than ever before. We've got to be careful of one thing. We've got to be careful that people don't equate it always with nationalism. And I don't believe in Never was. Nationalism. Never was equated ah, well, with nationalism. No, some people are beginning to think that. But the kilt oh. is worn more, and uh, I encourage it. You know, it's all very well to say people don't want to come to Scotland because of the tartan and the haggis image and so on. But that is what people really are interested in. They're not interested in coming to see whether we've got a new uh, steelworks or a new shipbuilding place oh, or whatever. God, no. no, no, they want to come and see the origins of Scotland. In other words, the kilted Scot is much like the red-coated Mountie. He's something for the tourist to take a picture of. He likes that, or he should like it, but I believe that kilts are being worn more and more now as ordinary, normal, comfortable dress. It's a great dress. Guy drafty. 
<laughs> well, it depends what you want, wear underneath. You and I know fine that there's nothing worn under the kilt by a man who's wearing a kilt seriously, well, properly and professionally. That's true, but if you're going on television and if there's any drafts around, you take precautions. Oh, we have a number of imitation Scotsmen in Canada, like Farley Mowat. How the devil he becomes an imitation? He's a famous, <laughs> isn't he? And he dances around this country in a kilt and makes yeah. a great caper, you know. Yeah. Just annoys yes, yes. the well, devil out of me. Yeah, you can have too much of it, I agree. Uh, too much of a kilt is a good thing. And no enough is, is no really good either. <laughs> okay, Robin McClellan. Oh, just give me a word in Scottish industry. Doesn't stand where it used to. No, it? it doesn't. It's changed very considerably. Scottish industry in many ways is in good order in many ways and in other ways is in poor order. Lots of the shipbuilding, the steel and the other things that which have been the background of many of us, Jack, have gone. And the great thing is, can we keep up with the times and can we get a sufficiency of modern, technically based product? Uh, that's, as far as I'm concerned, in the past now. But I know one thing, and it's this, that tourism, which is considered by some countries as almost beneath their dignity, mm -hmm. is of very great importance to the United Kingdom and of tremendous I'm, importance. And furthermore, I'm now going to deliver to you a strong remonstrance. Is yes, that sir. the word remonstrance? I think so. If it's I'm going to what tell I'm, you off. You're going to kick me in the pants. I'm right? going to tell you off. Nowhere in any of your tourist stuff that I've ever read do you take advantage to encourage people to come to the city of Glasgow, which is by far the best tourist headquarter and the brightest city with the brightest people in all of Scotland. I so agree, and I'm delighted to tell you that this has now been taken in hand. The Lord Provost of Glasgow, we Davy Hodge, is a great man, and he and his team are promoting Glasgow as a centre for tourism. And not only as a centre, in the city of Glasgow, we've got some of the finest Victoriana, some of the most beautiful old Victorian Greatest buildings. Greatest museum of ships in the world, and the model superb, ships. Superb, lovely art gallery. An art gallery here that makes this one look like a newsstand yes. compared to a library. A complete That's a slap in the teeth to Vancouver Art Gallery, <laughs> as if you didn't get yeah. it. And a completely new art gallery being built just now for what's known as the Burrell Collection, which is one of the finest collections of art in the world. Is that the man that used to the chain of sweetie shops? No, 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 that was Buchanan. Oh. I, uh, that was another, that was Birrell. Oh, it was Birrell. Uh, Birrell. Now, this oh, is Birrell. Birrell. He had a chain of ships and made money out of it in the First World War. Central Station still a pig pen? No, uh, a little less so than it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Street Station still there? Queen Street is, but... Uh, Gruesome place. Buchanan Street is gone. No, no, rails are important now, and I think that British rail has improved immensely. I'm telling you, to go to Queen Street Station is an experience in Victoriana the last time I was there. <laughs> I'm so old, yeah. although I'm not quite as old as you, that I remember when the fastest subway in Europe, that's the underground, the Glasgow Underground, yes. was run with a rope. With ropes, you're right. A tarry rope. Yes. Must have been a, must have been around a cable or something, but you could smell this tarry yeah, rope yeah. the moment you went into the underground right. to get on Eglinton Street to go to Albert's Park to go yeah. to the game yeah. to take part in this week's riot. That's true, and I always thought there were about a hundred fellows up at the end of the road somewhere <laughs> pulling the rope to get you through. But that has all changed, and Jack, when you come back, you come in our new underground system, which is going to be opened by the Queen in about a month's time. In Glasgow. In Glasgow. Superb. Moving walkways. What a pity you knocked down all those beautiful buildings for these dreadful ring roads yeah. when all you had to do was clean them. And while we're on the subject again, one of the greatest architects in the world came out of Glasgow and his name was Greek Thompson. Of course. And there's an abominable hotel, a very fancy big hotel, the Albany. Mm -hmm. Beautiful inside. Yeah. Very expensive, very tony and all the rest of it. And just across from the Albany Hotel, some nitwit built an office building which obscures the front of Greek Thompson's yes, church. Yes, I, I agree. Why did you allow it? <laughs> <laughs> what should I have done? Laying down in the road and protested? But from yeah. a tourist point of view, that was a great pity. That was a shame. A shame. Because it's a city, city of fine architecture. It I really agree. is. I agree. Well, I've enjoyed blathering with you this morning. Jax, we lovely to see you again. Where is your base now, Robin McClellan, well, CBE? Well, in, in about three hours, it's going to be in an Air Canada plane, and I'll be back in Prestwick tomorrow morning. Or oh, Edinburgh. But the office of the tourist board is in Edinburgh, 23 Ravelston Terrace, Edinburgh. Anybody who wants to write Scottish Tourist Board, Edinburgh. In fact, we had the Lord Mayor, the Lord Provost, forgive me, of sure. Edinburgh on my radio show at one time. I can't remember his name. Can you? Well, they keep changing every two or three, every three years. But uh, I understand that Edinburgh is teamed up 
with Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah, there's a wee, wee fellow that went to the same school as me, but I try and keep it a secret. There's a city alderman called Warnock Kennedy oh, yes. who yeah. arranged that. Yes. Mind you, he has, like you, a very proper accent. Oh, terribly panned off. Terribly panned off. Right. Robin, that was good fun. Lovely, Jack. See Thank you Scotland so much. Scotland one of these years. Yes, if I, indeed. If I can scrape up enough minkies to get there. My <laughs> thanks to Robin McClellan, chairman of uh, the Scottish Tourist Board. Jim going to be on camera? You're going to see him on camera at all? Okay. Sure. We can just leave him where he is. Why don't you just stay here? We can just, we can, I can just mic it right here for you. Sure. And then you don't have to move at all. Actually, actually that makes more noise. Does it? Okay. And, uh, I got to change paper anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Jim, I'll come here to start back. Okay. You're going to come over here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just give him a nod. Say, so we look at him as if he's in the chest. Actually, come back up on here. Try to get a talk. You start hammering with paper. Yeah. Let's see how that's going to sound. I don't need much. I have got time at the end of this program to give you a couple of choice short letters. And the first one I want to refer to comes to you from Chilliwack, British Columbia. And it says, really enjoy your program, but the sound of typing in background during conversations is most annoying. Please close the door or whatever. Thanks, Chilliwack. All right, you want the door closed, I'll close the door. The door is closed. Yes. Next letter. Perfectly simple. The door is closed. The typing stopped. Nothing to it. Thank you very much. Next letter. Next letter. Thank you very much, Johnny. God bless you. Due to poor TV reception, I am forced to watch your program. I feel I know more about Canada than the USA in spite of yourselves. Congratulations, Jack Richardson, Lopez Island, Washington. And another letter coming up from behind the door. And it says, from Harrison Mills, British Columbia, somewhere along the way something has happened of which I know nothing about, but I have noticed that you never smoke on television. Could you or would you take a moment to tell us about it? Thank you, sir. I think it's L. Schmidt, Harrison Mills. Mr. Schmidt, I'm grateful for your concern. Please mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> How are you this morning, Linda? I'm fine. You're really enjoying yourself this morning, aren't I, you? I say, I really, despite the fact that I do have a slight sore throat mm. this morning, that I've enjoyed this program very much indeed. It's been a rough week, though, hasn't it? It has been oh, very tough. <laughs> you know, trying to make bricks without straw some mornings. What do you got for Monday? Oh, we're okay Monday. Right, we have Don Lockstead, the NDP MLA for McKenzie. And we also have a, a good uh, repertorial sharp piece from our man in the field. Brian Coxford. Oh, he doesn't stay too long on the field today. He'll get soaked to death, I think. Brian Coxford. Next week, we've got some good stuff lined up, too. I, Premier Bennett can't make it. No, but Dave Barrett will be with us on Thursday. Dr. Pat McGear will be with us on Friday. We have a couple of other stories that just might get to Developing. you next week. December yes. the 13th, Barrett will be here. That's right. Maybe he's prepared to come out of his shell. Right. He's playing very cool, as perhaps he showed up tonight. And we have Best of Webster on Sunday. Oh, 6.30 p.m. for the Best of Webster. Don't miss it. My thanks to Linda and all else around here, including Johnny and the other stagehand who stole the door. The typing's back. <laughs> Monday, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>